Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. We see biblically that the festivals of the Bible, the Lord's appointed times, they teach us biblical truth. They remind us of the things that God has done and the things that he will do to bring about a completion to his purpose. And that purpose ultimately is the kingdom of God, its establishment. And we see so frequently that these festivals have kingdom truth attached to them. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Exodus and chapter 34. The book of Exodus and chapter 34. Now, in this section, there is going to be an emphasis on festivals. And we see one of the primary purposes of these festivals when we understand the truth, when we remember the faithfulness of God, how he acted on these sacred days, when we are reminded of what he has done, why he's done it, and what ultimately will be the kingdom implications to these things. What do they do? They guard us from idolatry. In other words, through the festivals, and this is something you need to understand, through the festivals, we are reminded of God's kingdom purposes, what he does so the kingdom can be a reality, and how we guard against going after our own desires, seeking our own purpose. And what can we use as a way of, of a definition of, of seeking our own purpose? What defines that? One word, idolatry. Idolatry is always going after our will and setting God's will aside and trying to present falsehood that our will, our desires are really based upon religious truth. They are not. They are based and established in sin. Now, when we completed last week's study, we saw God reminding the children of Israel, don't make covenants with those of the land, with those who are not my covenant people. Don't enter into agreements with them. Because if you do, soon thereafter, you will give your children to be married to their children and you will find yourself worshiping their gods, living in an idolatrous life. So he guards us by saying, do not do these things. And not only does he say what's not to do, but he gives us what to to do. And these festivals are safeguards against idolatry. Notice where we left off. Look at verse 17. He says, and the gods of molten, that is created gods, do not make them. Do not do anything for, for them. Don't allow them to have any aspect any place, any relevance for your life. But now, verse 18, this is what he says. The festival of unleavened bread you keep. It's command. If you are my covenant people, you will do just that. Seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, which I've commanded you for the appointed month of Aviv. So the month of Aviv comes, and at that time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which begins the 15th day of the month, for seven full days, you are to eat unleavened bread. Now, are we under the law to do that today? No, 
But does that still have relevance? Yes, it does. In fact, you can't understand what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 about where he says, let us keep that festival with the unleavenedness, meaning without sin and pride, being humble people. So recognizing this day, marking it, studying about this festival still has purpose, still has spiritual relevance for us. It's good to learn this relevance and remember it on that day. It is not an obligation. It is a tool that we can utilize and should utilize for guarding ourselves against the attacks of the enemy. Verse 18, the feast of unleavened bread you shall keep. Seven days you shall eat matzah, unleavened bread, which I commanded you for the appointed month of Aviv. For in the month of Aviv you went out from Egypt. What is that exodus from Egypt? It speaks of redemption. And to mark, to remember that redemption, what do we do? We eat unleavened bread. Unleavened bread speaks of that which is sanctified, that which does not reflect pride or sinfulness, unleavenedness. So it's good to remember why God redeemed us so that we can live a sanctified life, a life without the effects of sin. We need to remember that. That is a message that many believers, they are forgetting. And they are embracing the ways of the world, seeking their prideful objectives rather than the objectives of God. Verse 19. Now, in order to emphasize redemption, tying the exodus from Egypt, what we just studied at the end of verse 18, with redemption, notice what he says. Every issue of the womb, everything that goes forth, from the womb, he says, is mine. From all your, your cattle, you shall, and it says here, all the cattle that, that bears a male, that whether it's an issue of the ox or the lamb from the flock, he says it's mine. Every male that, that breaks forth from the womb, that exodus from the womb, the firstborn, belongs to me. He goes on to say, look at verse 20, the issue, same thing for a donkey, you shall redeem it by offering up a lamb. And if you do not redeem this donkey, if you don't pay the price, redemption, if you don't, then it has the word his or at the back of his neck. And what it implies here is that you break its neck, you put it to death, you do not receive any benefit from that, that donkey, the chamor. You are called to redeem it for a lamb, but if you do not redeem it, you break its neck. All the firstborn of, of your, your children, you shall redeem. You shall not, you shall not appear before me empty, meaning empty hand. So we, and it's having to do with festivals, you go before the Lord with an offering. And that offering is tied to redemption. What it tells us is this. And redemptive experience gives us a desire to appear before the Lord and to worship Him, to offer, to make sacrifice, to present give to the Lord. Verse 21. Now he's going to be speaking about the Shabbat. He says, six days you shall do work, but on the seventh day you shall cease. You shall stop. And that word for ceasing or stop comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat. So six days you shall labor, you shall do work. But on the seventh day, you shall cease. In your plowing and in the harvest, you shall cease. So these things cannot be done in anything related to such behavior. Verse 22, we have another festival. He began by 
the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then he spoke about Shabbat, and now he's speaking about what we would call Shavuot or Pentecost, verse 22. The Feast of Weeks you shall do for yourself, meaning keeping it has a, a effect, a positive effect for the one who keeps it. The first fruit of the harvest of wheat. Now, it's barley and wheat. There's many debates there at the same time, but in a general sense, it says here, the first fruits of the wheat harvest. The festival, that's the additional festival, and now the third one, Chag Asif. This is the Feast of Tabernacles at the period of the year, meaning at the end of what? Well, it's at the end of this festival cycle. It happens at the end of the harvest time, at that period of the year when the year begins to change, to go from the end of summer into fall, when things begin to die at the end of the harvest. So it's called Chag HaSif here, not the Feast of Tabernacles, that's what it's referring to, but it's the festival of gathering, verse 23. Now, we learn from this passage and others, there are three times a year where there is, when the Bible, when the temple stood, that one would have to go up to Jerusalem. What are the three times? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, Shavuot, or Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles, called here Chag HaAsif, the Feast of Gathering. Some people call it the Ingathering Festival. So three times a year, it says, shall appear all your males before me, the Lord, the Lord, the God of Israel. Now, two things I want to say here. We have the term Adon for Lord, appear before the face of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. But we also have not the word Adon, but after the word Adon, the sacred name, yud heh the Lord. And then it ends, this verse ends with Elohei Yisrael. Now, the sages will tell us, as we study prophecy, recently taught a seminar from the book of Jeremiah. And in doing that, I demonstrated that the term Elohei Yisrael, is usually given within a last day or a kingdom context. So it's not simply a, a interesting occurrence that it says, Elohei Israel, the Lord, the God of Israel. That term Elohei Israel throughout the Bible has kingdom connotations. And what that does is it teaches us that these festivals have kingdom connotations to us. We learn about the kingdom. And that's exactly what Paul taught in Colossians chapter 2. When he says in Colossians chapter 2 that these festivals, they are a shadow of that which is coming. What's coming? The kingdom. So throughout the scripture, both the old and the new covenants, we see the festivals are our instruments of kingdom revelation, verse 24. Now, when we keep these festivals, God promises to do something. He responds in our life, in our situations. He says, for I will take possession of the nations before you. He says, don't you worry about the nations. This would be the enemies that would want to harm Israel, make war, take the land. He says, I'll, I'll handle the nations before you. And in doing these festivals, I will broaden your borders. And notice the end of verse 24. Now, the feeling was this. If all the men, according to what the scripture says, and oftentimes women and children would go up, but the, the obligation was upon every male 20 years and old. So normally that would mean every married male. He would go up. Oftentimes the wife and the children would not. And there was a chashash, a, a fear 
that if all the men were gone, this would give incentive to who? The enemy, the goyim, to come and take the land, wage war, and take the women and the children and the land because the men would not be there to defend it. But what does God say? Look carefully. He says, and no man, meaning no foreigner, that's the implication, will covet your land. He says here that that belongs to you. When you when you go up, when you go up to appear before the face or the presence of the Lord your God three times a year. So God says, don't worry about it. No man is going to covet your land, the land that you possess, your inheritance. When you go up, as it says here, when you go up to appear before the face of the Lord, your God, three times a year, verse 25. Now, in verse 25, it talks about, most would say, the Passover sacrifice. We need to realize something. The, the temple area never had chametz. All year round, it, you could say, was kosher for Passover. But notice it says here, do not slaughter upon the leaven the blood of my sacrifice and do not uh, leave until morning the sacrifice of the festival of Passover. So these two things would be tied to Passover. Don't offer up the Passover festival if there's any leaven in the land. And then he says, do not leave that Passover sacrifice from what you eat that night. Don't leave any of it to the morning because you have to consume it all or burn it up. Verse 26. The first of the fruits of your land you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. Now, all of these things, would you not agree are important? the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Shabbat, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles, and then going up three times a year to acknowledge the Lord, offering up to Him a gift, a sacrifice. And then He says, again, bringing the first fruits unto Him to the house of the Lord your God. All of these are significance, and notice how this, this section ends. Look at the end of verse 26. Lo tevashel gadi bachalev imo. Do not boil or cook a, a kid, meaning like a kid goat or a calf, in the milk, the milk of its mother. Now, most people. They derive from this all the laws of the separation of meat and dairy. Let's deal with this for a few minutes properly. Now, according to the sages, this is the classic example of safeguarding. Even though the law says one thing, the sages would add additional laws, additional commandments to, to guard yourself against that. Let me give you a, a silly example. Let's say that it's forbidden to go to London. That's what the Word of God says. Thou shall not go to London. So the rabbis come along, and in order to ensure no one goes to the city of London, they say it's forbidden to go to England. The Word says London. But they add and say, don't even enter into London. England. Why? Well, if you don't enter, enter, enter into England, you certainly won't go to London. So it's that fence, that additional. So what we have here is, according to history, there was a barbaric tradition among the pagans. They would take a, a calf or a young goat, and they would take its mother's milk and boil that, that animal and that which was supposed to, according to God, 
It's the milk that gives life. But they would misappropriate it and take what God gave for life, they would use for death. It was an act of defiance and rebellion, part of their pagan worship. So here, and this goes with the context, if you read the last part of our study last week, the verses 17, 16, 15, 14, you see it's all about not committing idolatry and boiling an animal in its mother's milk was an idolatrous practice. So this summarizes this section by saying, do not, do not take part in such a festival. Do not eat the meat from that animal that was, was killed in this torturous manner of being bore, boiled to death in its mother's milk. What did the rabbis do? In order not to have any evil appearance, there's something in Judaism called marit ein. What's marit ein? The appearance of an eye. We don't want, and Paul speaks about, give no evil appearance. Even though something might be permissible, we don't want someone to see what we're doing that's permissible, and they think we're doing something that's sinful. So marit ein is something that is permissible, but it looks as it's related to something sinful. So don't give an evil appearance. Well, because of being boiled in milk, there was a milk gravy. So the rabbis, to, to guard against any participation in that, that, that activity, that, that action of, of boiling an animal in its mother milk, they said, don't eat meat with any dairy because that would safeguard and no one would think that we are participating eating that animal that was dealt with in such that way. So that's the, the understanding, but the safeguard was do not mix dairy products with meat. Verse 27, and the Lord said to Moses, write for yourself, for you write these things for According to these things, I have written with you this covenant and with Israel. So these things that God instructs, we're going to see more specifically what they are. They form the basis of a covenant, a relationship with God, a promissory relationship between the children of Israel and the God of Israel. So he says to Moses, you write these things which according to the things which I have, have written with you, this covenant with the children of Israel. Verse 28. And it shall come about there with the Lord, that is Moses, it came about that he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. The number 40 signifies change. Through the, the revelation of God, Change comes. Change comes through his word. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And bread he did not eat and water he did not drink when he wrote concerning or upon these tablets which contains the words of the covenant. And then it says the Aseret Debrot, the Ten Commandments. So here we learn the Ten Commandments. There's other things, but the Ten Commandments are foundational. And as I shared before, it's, it's hard to do this in just talking, but we know of the two great commandments. They all have to do with love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These two. And there's a relationship. You can't love your neighbor until you experience the love of God. The way that you demonstrate your love for God is by loving your neighbor. So these two commandments are usually placed, the first, love the Lord your God. The second, underneath it, love your neighbor. And then underneath these two are the 10 commandments. So altogether, there's 12. And the remaining commandments, the 601, each one of these additional commandments are put under one of the Ten Commandments. 
So all the law relates to the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments relates to either, either loving your neighbor or loving your God. So if you look at the Ten Commandments, you'll find some have to do with responsibilities that you do to an individual. Others have to do with responsibilities that belong to you and God individually. What you do for Him and Him alone. So that's a little bit about understanding the law. Now, notice the last part, beginning in verse 29. We'll do this very quickly. It came about when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of testimony. Interesting, a change. The tablets of testimony. It's when we take the revelation of these words that are on the tablets that they provide for us the revelation so that we can have a testimony before God. We can do His will, fulfill His expectations. Verse 29, and it came about when Moses went down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of testimony in the hand of Moses when he went down from the mountain. And Moses did not know, but, and it has a word here, Karan. Now, Karan, it comes from a similar word, Karen, but this is biblical Hebrew. Sometimes it's pronounced a little bit different, like the term son, Shemesh, sometimes pronounced Shamish. Different terminology, same words, but different enunciation. This word has to do with like a ray. We have a sun ray. Well, there were a ray, illumination that emitted from the face of Moses. Moses, when he was up there 40 days and 40 nights, his appearance changed from being intimate with God, being in the presence of God, experiencing God, this holy intimacy. It was seen by testimony. So that's why this account is given immediately after, talking about the testimony of the, the tablets. Moses did not know that there was a ray from the skin of his face when he spoke with him because he spoke with God. Verse 30. And Aaron and all the children of Israel, it says, they saw, literally Aaron saw, and all the children of Israel. Moses, they saw Moses. Behold, there's that word of significance, behold, a ray. The skin of his face. They saw this ray that emitted, this, this light that emitted from the, the skin of his face. And it says here, they were afraid from approaching him. They didn't want to go near Moses. Verse 31. And Moses called unto them, and they returned unto him, Aaron, and all the, your Bibles may say, leaders. This is the word for, for presidents, meaning the president of each tribe in the congregation. And Moses spoke unto them, verse 32. And afterwards, all the children of Israel would approach, and, and he would command them all what the Lord had spoken with him, at Mount Sinai. Now I highlighted in verse 29 and verse 32, Mount Sinai. It's this elevated location. It shows a different perspective. And it's just to underscore what we studied last week. And that is that through the commandments of God, we see things from a different vantage point. When you obey, God gives you understanding he gives additional revelation verse 33 and when moses completed uh speaking with them it says he put upon his face a masve what's a masve it is a veil so at this time moses he put a veil over his face verse 34 and when moses would come before the lord to speak with him when Moses would go in God's presence at the Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, he would do something. He would remove this veil until he went forth. And when he went forth and spake with the children of Israel, what the Lord commanded him, he would do something. As he went forth 
It says he would return, we'll come to that, and place a veil on his face. Look at verse 35. And the children of Israel, they saw the face of Moses for the, the ray of the skin of his face of Moses. And therefore, Moses would return. He would bring back the, the veil upon his face until he went forth to speak with him that is with the Lord. Now, notice there's great significance in this veil. Because Moses, he was changed by being intimate, being in the very presence of God, hearing firsthand the revelation of God. And this veil showed a, a separation. It concealed. Why? Well, when they saw that they were afraid, they could not perceive they it's the same way that when someone would, would approach God, they would fall prostrate. There was a, a fear of the living God. And the only thing that makes this possible, that we can have this intimacy with God, is a redemptive experience. That's what, that's what the commandments of God, when we apply them to our life, not under the letter of the law. I want to conclude with one more, more scripture. Look, if you would, to the book of Romans and chapter 7. Now, if, if you could just study one verse this upcoming week, make it Romans chapter 7 and verse 6, a very important verse, and it speaks about something that's only relevant for believers, those who've experienced the redemption by means of the Lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua. The book of Romans, Romans chapter 7 and verse 6. We read, But at now, at now, at this time, and it speaks about having been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But now, at this time, after we have died, to that which enslaved us, bound us. What was that? Sin. We have died to sin when Messiah died upon that tree. We died with him. That's what he says in the previous chapter. We have been set free. Notice what he says. We have been set free from the law. And when he means law, he means the penalty of the law. In order to serve God, that's our desire. To serve God, how? In the newness of the Spirit. And not in the oldness of the letter, the written letter. So now, by means of the redemption of Messiah, we have within us the Holy Spirit. What is the primary role of the Holy Spirit? Well, he's our teacher. He will guide us into all truth. He, is, he brings righteousness in our life. But here's the key. He brings a do, godly order, a divine order. And that order fulfills the expectations of God. So now under the spirit of God, I can fulfill the intent of the commandments of God. And that is going to manifest in the same way that Moses being in the presence of God, receiving God's revelation. It changed his appearance. It gave him a new testimony. We, when we apply the revelation of God, when we walk in the spirit and not in the flesh, it's going to manifest the glory of God. And that ray that emitted from the face of Moses, it was a representation of the, God, of the glory of God. And now that's what we are supposed to do by behavior. We're supposed to reflect the glory of God, and it is going to give a powerful testimony. Well, I'll close with that. Chag Sameach, happy holiday, as we, we spend this upcoming week remembering the biblical truth of not just Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, but as a time of preparation for remembering the truth concerning the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement teaches us biblical truth about the Messiah, his work, his priesthood, 
and what we receive not by our actions but because of the actions the behavior the faithfulness of another one who is anointed in his father's place and ultimately who is that it's the high priest but here's the key the great high priest messiah yeshua we'll talk more about him and that festival next week but until then Look carefully at Romans 7, verse 6. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.